In the summer of 1988, Marcy Tigner released the video Learning to Do God's Work, which starred her puppet Little Marcy. Little Marcy was a puppet that was fashioned after Marcy Tigner herself as a little girl. However, Little Marcy, who was intended to delight and entertain young viewers, deeply disturbed and repulsed many children. The Little Marcy puppet was very old-fashioned, with a simple rod, arm base and an eerily realistic doll's head. A mechanism in her head allowed her eyes to blink, otherwise you'd always be staring into her cold and dead-looking eyes. Her mouth was always open in a joker-like smile, and only the lower part of her jaw was movable. In the video, Little Marcy is teaching her friends how to do God's work. Marcy's friends, however, came off as more cult followers than her actual friends. For one thing, these puppets were far less detailed and much more generic looking than Little Marcy was and were even simpler in design. Their attitudes made them seem more like Marcy's blind followers than her friends as well, since all of them were constantly surrounding her, asking her questions about herself and praising her. Many of the children who saw Little Marcy as a child are now atheists, and perhaps with good reason. Some unlucky children who saw the now extremely rare videotape at a young age went missing a few days later. There were many investigations into the disappearances of those 10 or 15 missing kids, but as of 2011 no evidence has ever been found. However, in 1990 another video was released, this one called Learning God's Love. Hardly anyone knows it exists, and many Marcy fans claim that it was never officially released by Marcy Tigner. According to the few people who claim to have seen it, this video takes place at the beach. This time, Marcy is joined by several new friends, all with different names and appearances. Strangely, the old friends from the previous video are gone with no explanation, and the 10 or 15 new friends' appearances match the hair and eye colors of the missing children incredibly accurately. I can see him out there. I know this game. Helpless, unsuspecting 20-something having a quiet night and while the folks are out of town, sits down to watch a scary movie. The setup is just too perfect. The only chance I've got is getting the first strike in. I'm not fucking going down like some two-dimensional agent start trying to pretend they're a teenager. Tools. What have I got? Enough, I hope. A quick check to make sure he's still there. Yeah, he's gone nowhere. I can see the mask and flowing black. Scream. The film about avoiding film cliches, and here I find one stood right in front of me. The only thing between us is the door. I'm sure he can hear my labored breathing, my not as light as I'd like footsteps. He rings the doorbell. Bastard, trying to catch me unaware. I don't fucking think so. I can just about make his knife out, clutched in close to his robe. It looks dull, tarnished. I'd call it lifeless, but it feels too much like an omen. I edge my way to the kitchen. The closest thing we've got to a weapon is the assortment of cooking knives. Fine. If it's a knife fight, then I'm going to make the first lunge. I compose myself for a minute, breathing some of the ash from my lungs before stepping back into the living room so I can make my way to the door. He's at the window. Game over. It's now or never. The police never get here in time. The knife is in my hand. Its weight isn't nearly as reassuring as I'd hoped it would be. The handle is moist in my sweaty palm and I'm trembling so much I think I'll drop it from behind my back and give the game away. This is it. My heart is practically through to my ribcage as I reach the door. No fear. If we're going down, go down fighting. I wonder if this is how every man on point felt when reaching a room, how the brave souls of D-Day felt as they climbed into their boats. Death, palpable, real, with a face. I twist the lock. The door swings freely, with a push. I taste the air. Trick. He stops. The knife. I'd never felt anything like it. The snag as it first hit, the grate as it connected with bone, the touch of the rope as my hand finished driving home my defense, my salvation. It was over. It took a few seconds for any reaction. I didn't know if it was enough. I stared into those black holes, which should hold eyes and saw nothing. Everything in me wanted to burst. He sways, a groan, comes from behind the mask. I smell blood as he falls. 
I stand, trying to will the life back into my limbs. This is the part where they catch you. Dead? Sure, dead just long enough for you to let your guard down. I drag him to the chopping block round back and make sure he's not coming back. It's all over. I get back inside and wash up. I cry and cry a lot. It feels like I've just been lifted from hell, Jesus wrapping a hand around my wrist when I most needed it. I've never been the religious type, maybe it's time that changed it. My heart drops right back down into the pit from where I was just lifted. There's a knock at the door, the doorbell ringing. I peer outside and see a group of children and teens, dressed as farmers. One looks like a priest. Stephen King, children of the corn. Religious fanatics, haunted by a bastarded deity roaming the fields. Five of them. Well, there may be more of them, but that means nothing. I've done this once, it's time for the sequel. I twist the lock. The door swings freely with a push. I taste the air. Trick or treat. Yeah, I'm not falling for that one. Three teenagers found a VHS tape in their trash can one night. They were curious to what was on it, so they took the tape inside, grabbed an old VCR from the closet in their parents' bedroom, hooked it up to a TV and watched. The video starts with a test pattern which quickly cuts to black for about six seconds. After that, occasional jumbles of color and static appear. At about the twelfth second, an eye appears, which is described to be empty of soul. The eye gets closer occasionally as the video goes on, along with black screens and random jumbles of colors. On the 43rd second, the eye appears with inverse colors and begins to move ever so closer. A beckoning hand appears on the 65th second, which switches to the inverse eye again, backing away. A black screen appears one more time. The static that has covered the whole video mysteriously clears away as the beckoning hand reaches out to you one more time, only to be followed by a piece of Russian text which roughly translates as hypnotize. The tape ends. Of the three teenagers, two committed suicide and the other one gave the tape to paranormal investigators saying hypnotize six times before passing out. The investigators privately uploaded the video to Rapid Share. The video was leaked to the general public and since then has vanished off of Rapid Share. The name of the video was hypnotize.av. Recently at the art gallery I work at, they had a new exhibition for local artists. It was the usual sort of thing, some standard paintings that only got a shoe in because they were from the local community, paintings of local people and places and so forth. It was my job to decide which paintings got put on display, which entailed me sorting through around a hundred of these awful excuses for art. There was one, though, that really caught my attention. Unlike the others it was not of a local scene or person, it was of a family. A father, in a suit, sitting in a chair, his dutiful wife behind him and his young son and daughter at his feet. By the looks of their clothes they were from the 19th century, typically dressed for a middle class family of that period. Two things struck me about the painting, firstly the attention to detail and the quality of the artwork was impeccable, almost photogenic, and second was the shiver it sent down my spine. The people in the portrait had this eerie, gaunt look to them, and expressions that were so blank they looked almost dead. The painting had no artist's name attached to it, and Molly from reception had said that she couldn't recall anybody sending it in. I decided then that instead of putting the painting on display I would take it home with me, after all it had no name attached to it, so nobody was going to miss it, were they? I got home and decided that I was going to hang it in my study, and after hanging it spent the rest of the night filing paperwork. Every so often I would find my eyes drawn to the painting. I felt the strangest and most uncomfortable sensation. I felt like the family in the painting were somehow judging me, like I could feel their eyes boring into me from the painting. What's worse is that because they were staring at the painter, and therefore anybody who looked at the painting, their eyes seemed to follow me around the room. After a while I couldn't take it anymore, I turned the painting against the wall and vowed that, no matter how interesting it was, I would return it to the gallery the next day. I got a hold of myself though, I had been working quite late and was very tired, and decided that I would sleep on it. I began to finish off the last of my filing at my desk. 
This was a bad idea. My eyes were heavy and before I knew it I had fallen asleep right there in the study. That night, my dreams were filled with visions of the painting. Over and over again all I dreamed about was that family staring at me from behind the canvas, drilling into my soul with their blank, visionless stares. With every dream they seemed to get more and more intense, until after a while their eyes were wide, and they were giving me looks of such intense hatred that I thought they were about to kill me. After a while I snapped into awareness to find myself face to face with a painting, except this time instead of blank expressions I was faced with a hellish vision that will haunt me until I die. Their faces were twisted into looks of absolute malice. Their gaunt waxen skin was drawn taut across their pointed cheekbones, their lips peeled back across blackened gums to reveal gnarled yellow teeth, bared in a bestial snarl. The less that was said about their bloodshot, protruding eyes the better. I screamed and fell off my chair, stumbling out the room, unable to turn and look back at the painting. I ran across the hallway and dived into my bed, burying my head under the covers. The next morning, when I woke up, I was still terrified. I rationalized it to myself though, you were overtired and you had a night terror, the room was dark and both the shadows and your mind were trying to play tricks on you. I went about my usual routine unperturbed, comforted by the rational logic of my mind. I was about to go to work when I realized I had forgotten about the papers in the study. I opened the door to grab the papers but as soon as I set foot in the room my heart froze and my blood ran cold. The painting was still turned against the wall. Not only that, but my desk had not even been facing the painting to begin with. It was facing the window. Trick or treat! Oh, oh, you want some trick or treat? Okay, here's some trick or treat for you. <laughs> There you go, you little fuckers. There's some chocolate for you. That's not chocolate, that's poop. It's not chocolate, nor is it poop. It's shit. <laughs>